Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to Houston Methodist uh, Grand Rounds. Um, we have a treat today in our continuing series. Uh, today we have the last of our uh, virtual fellows Grand Rounds for this year. Um, we are going to have uh, Dr. Misha uh, Nareskin give his first talk and followed by Dr. Adi Lador, uh, who's one of our graduating EP fellows. A um, couple of <coughs> housekeeping issues. First of all, just to remind you, uh, or if you're new to this series, um, this will be two uh, grand rounds, each just under 30 minutes uh, to complete the hour. Uh, we have an interactive uh, op opportunity here, so if you want to text or email questions, you do that by going to uh, texting the word DeBakey, D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, to the phone number 37607. Uh, once you join that, then we'll have an open form and you can send in your questions. Alternatively, you can go to pollev.com uh, slash debakey. Uh, <laughs> I think that has been presented on the screen and that'll be shown to you again at the end. Um, so first off, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, one of our graduating uh, general cardiology fellows, uh, Misha uh, Nareskin. Uh, Misha uh, was born and raised uh, in Western Russia in uh, Smolensk, uh, went to medical school there, uh, and um, then went to uh, UC San Diego for internal medicine, uh, has been with us for three years in Houston in our general cardiology uh, program. Um, we're very happy that he's delighted, uh, we're delighted that he is uh, staying on to do interventional cardiology with us. Um, and really we're happy that he uh, sort of reinvigorated our semi-annual paintball challenge. Uh, and he is a legitimate sniper in paintball. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the extent of his bio for this morning. Um, he is going to um, talk to us about, uh, is there a doctor on board and cardiovascular uh, emergencies uh, while flying? Uh, over to you, Misha. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Little, for stressing the priorities. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for tuning in for, uh, uh, for Grand Rounds this morning, uh, the topic of my Grand Rounds. Is there a doctor on board? And uh, as Dr. Lilo mentioned, it's going to be about in-flight medical emergencies. Well, first of all, let, uh, let me remind you what the flying is. Unfortunately, we all um, forget about that. So flying is a fascinating process. Huge metal bird get, get you high into the sky next to the sun. Really fascinating. Hopefully, we're all going to experience that soon. Um, again. So why this topic is important, in-flight emergencies? Well, I personally participated in five of them, uh, which uh, raised interest for me, but they're not that uncommon. Uh, they, uh, they happen on average one per each 600 flights. And uh, depending on which um, airline company you're looking at, the statistics um, on, on a daily basis, about 250 to 1400 in-flight emergencies happen. So it's not that uncommon. Majority of them are pretty benign, like Singapore events or some GI um, events, but some of them can be life-threatening, which cause uh, uh, actual diversions on, of the aircraft. So the topic is, is quite, quite important and quite interesting. And uh, why you have to, to listen to this during the cardiovascular ground rounds, well, I would bet that altitude is a great equalizer. No matter where you stand on the, on the hierarchy ladder, or no matter which specialty you're practicing, uh, cardiology or plastic surgery, once you hit the altitude of 30,000 feet, everybody gets equal. Everybody become medical professional and uh, uh, should somehow respond to the in-flight emergency. So the outline for my, for my uh, talk today, we're gonna briefly um, talk about the physiology of air trail, what changes once we hit altitude. We're gonna talk about um, medical resources which are at our hand on flight. Um, we're going to discuss legal ramifications of providing help on board. And finally, we're going to talk about assessing of fitness to fly, not just for the passengers, but for the pi pilots as well. So let me start with the physiology of air travel. Commercial aircraft fly at a cruising altitude of 30 to 40,000 feet. And uh, uh, to do that, the aircraft cabin usually pressurized so effectively, once you're flying, you are at the equivalent of approximately four to 8,000 feet altitude. And that leads to the expansion of any uh, gust containing spaces in your body. It is important for patients post-op, uh, for patients post-GI uh, or abdominal surgeries and during the uh, pneumoperitoneal lapros uh, laparoscopic procedures. Very important for patients after um, CT, surgeons, uh, CT surgeries, um, 
if they have a small uh, missed pneumothorax, it can expand during flight. So that's something to keep in mind and something um, um, to look at. If um, critical patients get transferred by air with a balloon pump, balloon pump also a uh, closed gas containing uh, chamber, so it can expand uh, with the altitude and uh, some adjustments needs to be made during flight and that's something you have to keep in mind sending patients uh, for a transfer. Uh, next, uh, once we hit altitude, the uh, uh, partial pressure of oxygen drops might be not so noticeable for healthy, um, healthy passengers, but for passengers with chronic or underlying cardiovascular problems or respiratory problems, um, it can be quite an issue and uh, um, chronic, some chronic condition can decompensate and uh, uh, in-flight emergency can happen. Uh, prolonged sitting and hypoxia uh, trigger uh, decreased venous flow and put patients at higher risk for venous clotting and venous thrombosis. Uh, not so prevalent between healthy patients, but again, at patients, for patients at high risk, um, it, it is more prevalent and they're gain at risk for gain DVT or even PE during flight. And that's not only um, uh, these three uh, major changes. The air to, be to the cabin is pumped through the, en through the engines, so the air gets very uh, dry, which leads to the dehydration of the passengers. Um, the, uh, uh, the cabin of the aircraft is an enclosed uh, space, so any infections can be easily transmitted. And then the flying itself is a quite a stressful um, environment for some of the passengers, which triggers catecholamine surge and can also exacerbate some underlying cardiovascular problems. Well, um, the above mentioned um, uh, changes or just a uh, poor luck, um, unfortunately can trigger in-flight emergency. And uh, here you are uh, sitting and hearing the um, sort of a doorbell and the uh, crew is asking, is there a medical professional on board? And uh, all eyes on you. And uh, at that time, you, you started to think that you should stop flying in scrubs. Uh, it, it came too noticeable. And uh, uh, you should remember, but you're not alone. And you have some resources at hand should you reply to or respond to an in-flight medical emergency. The Federal Aviation Administration actually mandates the um, aircraft companies to have some kits on board and at least one um, electronic um, automatic defibrillator must be available for, for crew to, to use or for medical professionals uh, to use in flight. So here is the actual list of the uh, tools and medications which you have at hand should you reply to medical emergency. And you have some um, tools to actually examine the patient like a stethoscope or check a blood pressure. You have a kit to start an IV should that be needed. You have oxygen. Um, but also you have uh, quite a few medications to, to administer. You have epinephrine pushes, you have nitro tablets, uh, you even have a bag of normal saline to give to the patient, you have aspirin, you have uh, uh, non-narcotic pain medications. So not too comprehensive, but still something for you to work with and something for you to, to provide some minimal uh, but life-saving uh, measures. And uh, again, as I've said, you're not alone. You actually have some ground-based medical support. Uh, so the aircraft or air flight companies usually contract some ground-based uh, uh, medical professionals, usually ER physicians, who are uh, taking a call, uh, basically, in, in case something happens in the air, the, uh, the crew of the aircraft can contact the ground-based medical support and discuss uh, what's going on. And uh, your role in this scenario is to um, sort of provide medical opinion of or medical assessment of what's going on. And uh, uh, you can come up with a mutual decision and mutual recommendations with ground-based physicians um, and recommend the captain of the uh, ship uh, for their actions. Is it safe to continue the flight or uh, decisions to divert should be made? So uh, let's briefly talk about the specific medical emergencies which you can encounter. The most common is uh, syncope, about 30% of all in-flight emergencies. Majority of them are just simple vasovagal, but some can be um, um, quite life-threatening, like cardiac causes, if patients having acute um, cardiac syndrome, 
um, not to be missed stroke or uh, some pulmonary distresses. So uh, that's where the art of medicine comes, comes really to peak and uh, that's where you, you have to do a um, focused history taking, you have to do focused review system and uh, physical exam which will uh, guide you one way or another on your differential. And uh, here are some measures which you can um, provide uh, to, to the passengers on board. Uh, you can lay them flat either on the seats or in the aisle. Um, you can give them some um, sweet dr drinks like uh, um, orange juice. You remember you have an IV bag, bag of fluids you can administer. You have epinephrine and uh, um, you can check blood pressures. You can give some oxygen. So um, something, something to, uh, uh, to think about and uh, um, to remember that there is uh, kits and medications which you can administer and help the patient in the, in the syncopal event. In patients with uh, chest pain or some cardiovascular symptoms, um, also not that uncommon, about 7 to 10 percent of in-flight emergencies, that's where the um, history taking uh, comes to the uh, most important role. And uh, you have to identify patients with past medical history of uh, some coronary disease or heart failure. Um, importantly to take review system and uh, focus on cardiovascular symptoms like chest pain, dyspnea, uh, jaw pain. Um, and uh, in some settings, some aircraft companies actually have this uh, novel um, EKG machines where you can get a 12 lead just from the fingertips. Um, you can use these novel watches which can um, provide you the rhythm and you can see if there is any arrhythmia going on or bradycardia otherwise. So um, again, the art of medicine, what you can um, provide treatment-wise, well, you have oxygen, you have aspirin, be caution with the nitroglycerin because patients can be hypotensive um, on the altitude, so check the blood pressure first. Um, otherwise, you can give IV fluids to, to help with uh, um, hypertension. And should you be very suspicious about the true cardiovascular emergency, the recommendation to divert the plane um, uh, can be delivered to the captain of the, of the ship who um, ultimately makes that call. Respiratory distress, again, about 10%. Um, you can administer oxygen, you can give albuterol um, inhaler. If there is an allergic reaction you suspect, uh, you can give epinephrine or uh, Benadryl. And again, if there is a true cardiovascular arrest or distress, contact the um, captain and tell that uh, the patient is or passenger is not doing well and you suggest the plane to be diverted. If you really want to ace me uh, medical emergencies, um, I can recommend you this uh, JAMA article which um, provides this wallet size cards for all types of medical emergencies, not just the one I mentioned, but uh, 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 GI emergencies, psych emergencies, ob guide emergencies, and uh, uh, won't take much space, but can be very handy in case you find yourself in a the, in, in the situation like this. And um, the ultimate emergency, which requires the um, diversion of the plane, a uh, very complicated decision to make for a pilot, a lot of uh, things to consider, uh, distance to the uh, closest airport, uh, logistics of transferring all the patients on, on, on board uh, to their destinations. And um, in some, and sometimes it's just hard to or impossible to land the plane with uh, full tanks of, uh, of gasoline. So um, ultimately the captain of the ship is the only person who can make the decision to divert the plane, uh, but you can provide your recommendations to, to him or her. Let's move to legal ramifications of providing uh, medical help on board. As uh, uh, Lord Justice uh, Smith famously um, said, um, our only duty as medical professionals in a matter of law is not to make the victim's condition worse, um, which I think is a quite fair statement. Um, remember, once you um, decide to assist a passenger in, in medical emergency, you establish or create doctor-patient relationship, which falls by your obligations to provide care and falls with liability risk. Liability is generally determined under the law of the country in which the aircraft is registered. And uh, uh, it is important to remember that U.S. healthcare providers traveling on U.S. airlines 
have no legal obligations to assist in the, in the event of in-flight emergencies. Um, ethical obligations, yes, but no legal obligations. And to protect um, medical professionals who find themselves in, in the situation of medical emergency, 1998, the Congress passed the Aviation Medical Assistance Act uh, to actually protect medical providers uh, from liability and uh, thereby encourage them to um, assist in medical emergencies. And here is the um, actual citation of that, um, of that law. Um, An individual shall not be liable for damages um, providing um, help and care in, in the case of in-flight emergencies. Granted, uh, there is no gross negligence or willful misconduct. So some um, caveats of, of this law. The care provided must be for medical emergencies, not just uh, routine or uh, uh, not just routine counseling. This law is limited to the claims arising from the domestic flights um, and uh, um, international flights on a United States carriers or for United States residents. International flights using international carriers may operate under other laws, but um, majority of, of the countries have some sort of Good Samaritan law similar to the um, Aviation Act um, you know, introduced in the United States. And uh, it is important to remember that many other countries like Australia or some countries in Europe do impose a legal obligation to assist. But once again, they have similar laws like Good Samaritan Acts to protect you from liabilities in case you have to, um, you have to provide help. And uh, when a healthcare provider potentially at legal risk under this law? Well, uh, as I said, unless you're grossly negligent, example of that can be providing care uh, being intoxicated. So having a few drinks on board and providing medical care is not a good idea. Um, next, you are um, under the law, under the protection of, of the law, as long as you do not receive any monetary comp compensation or bonuses from the um, airline companies. So uh, should you accept the offer uh, to be upgraded to business class or some coupons or vouchers, um, once you get that sort of compensation, you lose the protection of the, um, of the uh, uh, Healthcare Act. So that's something important to, to keep in mind. And uh, remember, once you um, establish the patient-doctor uh, relationship, you have to abide and follow the HIPAA privacy rules. So it's not a good idea to start Twittering or uh, putting a Facebook uh, post about um, the passenger which you just helped and uh, uh, disclosing his uh, um, personal information. You will get sued for that. Next, we're gonna move to the um, discussion and uh, assessment of fitness to fly, not just for the uh, passengers, but also for the uh, commercial pilots. So we often get these questions from the patients, when is it safe for us to fly after some sort of procedure or hospitalization? Or we see actual commercial pilots asking, well, what kind of procedures and tests should I, ha should I do to, to get my um, pilot license? So for patients with uh, coronary artery disease, um, the rule of thumb, if the condition is stable, it's okay for them to fly. For the, so for the stable coronary artery disease, patients are good to go. If the situation is unstable, like unstable angina or acute heart failure, well, it's pretty obvious it's not recommended for, for the um, patients to, to um, take any, um, any flight. For patients post-MI, if that was an uh, uncomplicated, um, uh, sort of minor heart attack, um, they can fly if, it's, if their condition is clinically stable. Uh, for patients with uh, a complicated condition, well, it's better to wait for a couple of weeks. And in some patients, it's actually recommended to um, go through some uh, stress testing or risk um, assessment before you can safely recommend them or advise to fly. For patients post-PCI, um, they can actually travel two days after the procedure safely. For patients f uh, with uh, a bypass surgery, uh, they can travel uh, 10 days after an uncomplicated procedure. And as I mentioned before, um, we need to make sure that there is no um, contained gas hiding their um, chest cavity, so no pneumothorax developed during the 
in flight and uh, um, uh, decrease of um, pressure. So for patients with heart failure, um, stable condition, uh, stable heart failure, no further testing recommended, unstable, do not advise patients to fly it. In unstable patients, it's actually absolute contraindication. Uh, patients with LVADs uh, can travel safely, uh, but uh, um, they should take, take into consideration where they go in and make sure that there are actually some uh, advanced heart failure center in case some emergency happen at their point of destination, so some logistics for, for them to figure out. But otherwise, altitude is not a contraindication for, for LVAT patients, as long as, they, as long as they stay well hydrated uh, during the flight. For patients with cardiac arrhythmias and recent pacemakers or ICD, um, it is recommended for them to have their device cards at hand, as well as most recent EKG. And uh, once they go through the um, customs or uh, pre-flight surge, the hand surge is preferable. It is very un uncommon uh, and unusual to um, induce any, um, any artifacts or arrhythmias by the metal detectors, but still um, it is uh, preferable to have a hand surge for this type of patient. Next, the uh, topic of thromboembolism and air travel. As I mentioned before, um, hypoxia prolonged Im immobilized um, position induces the venous stasis and can put uh, patients at risk for venous thromboembolism, but the actual risk in healthy population remains quite low. Uh, most cases of uh, DVTs or PEs occur in patients with predisposing risk factors, uh, and it's, it's important to know that the patients remain at risk for uh, development of DVT for up to one month after long distance flight. And about 10% of the patients, DVT actually um, remain silent and, uh, and sort of never diagnosed. We have uh, recommendations from the American Society of Chest um, Physicians, um, and uh, it is uh, recommended to provide a medical treatment with enoxaparin single shot only for the patients who are deemed to be a high risk. And uh, these are the patients flying for long distance, um, long duration flight, more than eight hours. And those patients who have history of previous DVTs or PEs or history of hypercoax states like uh, um, F5 Leiden deficiency or recent major surgery. So for those patients, you can recommend a single dose um, an octoparent shot before the flight, and it's a great to B recommendation. For all other patients, no medication are recommended or necessary, no aspirin, no enoxaparin shots, but you should recommend them to, um, to ambulate during the flight as much as possible, avoid constrictive clothing, um, actually recommend uh, uh, compression stocking and um, uh, good hydration during the flight to uh, minimize the risk of any venous stasis. And finally, <coughs> we're moving to the topic of assessment of fitness to fly for the commercial pilots. So um, to start with, uh, we as, uh, um, as, as general providers or doctors do not um, issue licenses for pilots. It's the uh, prerogative of Federation of um, um, Aviation. And, uh, um, but we can, can facilitate um, that process for the pilots. And we often see those um, patients in our clinics asking to, to, to have some testing done so they can reapply or um, have initial applications for their licenses. So having a coronary artery disease and even um, a heart attack is not a contraindication for the pilots to fly as long as they can, can pass the testing. So depending on the extent of their coronary artery disease, their recovery times and the workup necessary is different. So for patients with a sort of um, major coronary disease who underwent a cabbage or left main stenting, the recovery time is usually six months. And after that, they go through the comprehensive workup, including the uh, treadmill stress test and uh, um, actual coronary angiogram. For patients with uh, uh, PCIs, uh, with or without um, MIs, the recovery time is usually three months. And again, uh, at the end of recovery, they have to pass uh, a treadmill stress test and have an additional coronary angiogram. So um, the, the records which the pilots have to submit to the FAA is the comprehensive records of their prior hospitalization during the event, 
plus a uh, sort of fresh stress test plus a um, fresh uh, coronary angiogram. So they effectively have to go through the angiogram twice to, to get their license back. And for the patients with, uh, with arrhythmias, depending on the type of arrhythmia, the workup and the uh, process for the license issuance is different. For um, sort of benign or simple arrhythmias like bundle branch blocks, uh, PACs, PVCs, first degree AV block, or Mobitz type 1 block, um, you provide to the FAA comprehensive, your records of comprehensive exam. Pilots have to go through the treadmill stress testing um, and uh, echocardiogram. And if there is no evidence of structural functional coronary disease based on the testing, uh, FAA usually issues the license to the pilot with no issues. But should the pilots have any advanced um, uh, conduction delays or pre-excitation or history of SVT, um, despite providing all this workup, the decision is made on uh, base um, uh, to base uh, uh, structure. So on this, um, I would thank you for your attention and uh, I wish you safe travels. Hopefully we'll get back to the air soon. All right, thank you, Misha. That was uh, fascinating. Um, we have time for just a couple of questions. Um, the obvious question is this topic choice. Uh, it was pretty unique, um, fascinating for a lot of medical professionals. Did you have an experience or something that made you want to uh, tell us about this? Yeah, as I mentioned, I, I somehow have a, have a particular luck to, to participate in medical emergencies. I'm not flying that often as an average person, maybe once every half year, but I've been finding myself in medical emergencies almost every flight, usually pretty, pretty benign syn syncopal events. But after the second event I've been participating, I started to think, well, what's at my hand and what's actually legal ramifications of me providing help, what things I should avoid, and do I actually have to help? Um, so that raised my interest in this topic and uh, uh, led eventually to this Grand Rounds presentation. And I think it's, as I said, altitude is the great equalizer. Right. Yeah. Once we hit the altitude, there is no difference. And then um, I saw a question, let me see if it comes up, uh, that was texted in. Um, so in this, you know, COVID era where we're all getting used to virtual visits and mm -hmm. new interactions with patients remotely, um, how do you think that might impact the whole paradigm of what's happening on a plane when you can just have a FaceTime-like uh, mm -hmm. encounter with a medical professional on the ground. Uh. I think that will come very handy for the, for the crew. Um, not all the flights have a medical professional on board, but the crew actually gets trained in, the, in providing um, CPR and some emergency help. And uh, now, luckily, due to the satellites, there is an internet con connection on board, and I think it will be possible to sort of FaceTime or do some video chat with ER physicians with which I mentioned the ground-based medical facilities and show the video of the, in, of the passenger in distress and uh, that will be um, much better information for the ER doctor on the ground rather than just communication through sort of three hands, the flight attendant, captain, down to, uh, down to the ground. And that will facilitate and, and, and fasten the decision making and uh, improve the um, outcomes for the passengers. Great. Thank you, Misha. Thank you. Uh, do we have Dr. Valderbano with us? <laughs> Where do I? All right, so next is going to be a presentation by Dr. Adi Lador. She has been a uh, fellow with us for the past two years in, in electrophysiology. <laughs> she came to us from Israel, where she attended the Hada uh, Hadassah Medical School at uh, Hebrew University, and then did uh, internal medicine and cardiology at Tel Aviv. Uh, she's been with us uh, for the past two years. She's uh, made remarkable progress as an electrophysiologist. And as an avid runner, um, she is fascinated by the electrophysiological challenges that the exercise uh, puts on the heart, especially as related to cardiac arrhythmias. Uh, she is going to stay with us one more year as an advanced EP fellow starting in July, hopefully, or August. 
and we're looking forward to your presentation. Abby. Thank you, Dr. V, for that uh, introduction, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today for our virtual grand round. Like Dr. V mentioned, I will talk about today about arrhythmias in athletes. I have no disclosures. So what are we going to talk about today? A few weeks ago, we had a thorough overview by Dr. Bat about screening process of an athlete. So I will be able to focus more deeply about the EP aspects. I will briefly review the epidemiology of uh, arrhythmia in athletes, discuss some of the exercise-induced uh, physiological changes related to the development and maintenance of arrhythmias <coughs> in athletes, and I will discuss in more detail the associations of sports with uh, specific uh, arrhythmia and how specific conditions can get worse by exercise. Sports participation have increased among the U.S. population over the last few decades, as you can see in the graph on the right. There is a significant benefit of physical activity for the reduction of cardiovascular disease. However, there is evidence of increasing the risk of sudden cardiac death with exercise. The annual risk of sudden cardiac death in the athlete is between 0.5 to 1 per 100,000 athletes per year. Uh, the studies indicate that exercise increased the risk by, for sudden cardiac death by 2.4 to 4.5 relative to a non-athlete. The risk for sudden cardiac death is elevated during and immediately post-exercise. In the United States, in athletes less than 35 years, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is about a third of all sudden cardiac death. Congenital coronary anomalies account for about another 20%, and every, everything else is less common, including myocarditis, channelopathy, and ARVD. Of note, this is only U.S. data. When you look in Italy, about 25% of the cases related to ARVD, and a small minority are hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. A consistent finding across studies is that male athletes have a three to five times higher incidence of sudden cardiac death uh, than female athletes. Data from a pros prospective study performed in France showed a lower incidence of sports related to uh, sudden death in women. Well, does physical activity cause more arrhythmia besides sudden cardiac death? In a big cohort study from Sweden that followed uh, all who completed an intense cross-country ski race, a fast finishing time and a high number of complete, uh, completed race were associated with higher risk of arrhythmia, as you can see in the graph below. This was mainly driven by a higher rate of atrial fibrillation and bradyarrhythmia. Briefly, I will talk now on how exercise may impact the athlete's heart and may cause him to become more prone for arrhythmia. First, let's understand what is an athlete. Clearly, different volumes of activity will impact the heart differently. Sport activity is a spectrum from recreational to an elite athlete. For example, it's, uh, this study found that about three hours of weekly exercise, you start to observe some impact on the heart. Specifically, they found lower basal heart rate, increase in peak VO2 max and LV mass. The American Heart Association have created a classification scheme of sports activity based on their dynamic and static components. Cardiac alterations are particularly profound in those athletes engaged in high intensity activities that are of long duration and combined endurance with power, which you can see here in the upper right corner, for example, cycling, triathlon, and rowing. Regular intense physical activity results in several structural, electrical, and functional cardiac adaptations that together constitute the athlete's heart. In the previous lecture, lecture Dr. Bat gave a detailed description about uh, most of those uh, changes. I would like mainly to concentrate on the changes that may lead or exacerbate arrhythmia. First, briefly about the structural adaptations. Generally, all four chambers of the heart can be influenced by the exercise. Dynamic exercise primarily causes a volume load on the LV and eccentric LV enlargement, whereas static exercise causes a pressure load and a concentric LV hypertrophy. Sports that involve high dynamic and high static demands may, demands may cause a mixed hypertrophy. Strength uh, endurance ex uh, exercise can cause pulmonary pressure and increase RV wall stress, and that may lead to RV enlargement. Studies, uh, few studies confirmed high prevalence of LA enlargement in uh, trained athletes, and that may uh, be a factor in the pathogenesis of AFib, as we will talk later. 
Also, there have been reports of areas of delayed uh, gadolinium enhancement in the wall of the LV uh, in athletes. There is no clear definition on when, uh, when such cardiac remodeling may increase the risk for arrhythmia. Shortly, uh, about the neurohormonal response to exercise. The physiological response to exercise starts with withdrawal of the parasympathetic tone and enhanced sympathetic activity. Sympathetic activation increases the, the heart rate and myocardial contractility. Activation of the beta adrenergic receptor from cyclic AM, forms cyclic AMP that activates protein kinase A, PKA. Phosphorylation of certain proteins by PKA is the key to the sympathetic mediated effect on the heart. Direct cyclic AMB binding enhances the IFANI pacemaker current and leads to increases in the SA node activa activation rate and sinus tachycardia. Phosphorylation of the L-type calcium channel by PKA leads eventually to a larger intracellular calcium transient and directly enhanced contractility. Sarcoplasmic reticulum um, calcium leakiness can contribute to, to the arrhythmogenesis as we will discuss later in CPVT. PKA also phosphorylate the KCNQ1 protein, which forms the alpha subunit of IKS, the slowly activating component of the delayed rectifier current. That will cause enhanced current and shortening of the action potential. This mechanism is an important factor of the pathology of long QT1 syndrome 1, as I will mention later. The increase in catecholamines increase automaticity and trigger activity, which may lead to arrhythmias during exercise. I will proceed uh, now with reviewing the association of sport with specific arrhythmias. Due to the time limit, I will discuss only the most significant ones. The hallmark of the athlete's heart is sinus bradyarrhythmia, including sinus bradycardia, first degree AV block, and wenkebach mokwitz type 1, second degree AV block. Uh, we can see in this example here extreme bradycardia in a 16-year-old competitive cyclist who is completely asymptomatic. Heart rate can be as slow as 30, bit, 30 to 40 beat per minute at rest in the highly conditioned athlete and decrease to less than 30 beat per minute during sleep. Many asymptomatic athletes have also sinus poses at rest and during sleep. This is a normal phenomenon and usually will become suppressed by exercise. Uh, though sinus bradycardia is considered to be an expression of high vagal tone, recent studies have shown more fundamental changes that may be part of the remodeling process of the heart. This may explain why sometimes there is no full reversibility of sinus bradycardia after reduction of training volume. Atrial fibrillation may also be influenced by exercise. Several studies have shown that AFib incidence is lowest among the most physically active participants. For example, data from a cohort of veterans from Washington showed here. In this cohort, they evaluated the cardiorespiratory fitness by exercise stress test and followed for a median of 8.3 years. They found that lower level of exercise capacity was associated with a higher risk of AFib, and a higher level of exercise capacity uh, dose-dependent decrease in AFib risk. Clearly from this data, maintaining high cardiorespiratory fitness contribute to a lower risk of future AFib. However, the range of METs achieved in this study was lower than the typically achieved by endurance athletes, thus limiting any conclusions regarding the relationship between more frequent exercise training and AFib risk. For endurance athletes as a marathon runner and cyclist, there are evidence of higher risk of AFib. For instance, this study from Spain retrospectively analyzed data from runners who completed the Barcelona Marathon. They found that marathon runners had 8.8 .8 times more atrial fibrillation than age and gender matched non-athlete control group. Overall, the studies confirmed the association between AFib risk and endurance sport participation. A study who followed only men athletes for 12 years found that among men joggers, men who jogged five to seven times per week had a 50% higher risk of AFib than men who didn't exercise vigorously. However, women population most probably behave differently. In the lower graph, you can see here data from uh, meta-analysis from Austin. They demonstrated that moderate amount of physical activity reduced the risk of AFib in both men and women. However, as the intensity increased, the risk of AFib continued to decline in women, but significantly increased in men. 
The mechanisms that contribute to the excess of AFib among endurance athletes are unclear, although there have been several important insights that reveal how exercise training may, be, uh, may contribute. The initiation and maintenance of AFib is commonly through a rapidly firing ectopic focus or through multiple circuit re-entry. There is evidence that atrial ectopic activity may be elevated in athletes compared to controls, and this ectopic activity is dose-dependent. Athletes also experience autonomic changes, as I mentioned before. On the one hand, a dominant vagal tone at rest, and on the other hand, burst of high sympathetic activity during acute endurance exercise. A high vagal tone can lead to bradycardia, which is a contributor to a generation and propagation of AFib. Increased vagal activity also shortens the atrial refractory period. That enhanced the excitability of the myocardium, both factors short shorten the excitation wavelength, thus facilitate re-entry and AFib. High sympathetic stimulation during exercise may also predispose to AFib by shortening the atrial um, action potential and sympathetically induce micro re-entry. As I mentioned also before, intense sport activity creates structural remodeling of the, atrial, of the atria, including atrial dilatation can, that can predispose to AFib, and atrial fibrosis, as demonstrated in few animals models, and uh, can be part as a rhythmogenic substrate. Also, we know that their high level of circulatory prolifer uh, proliferatory um, pro-inflammatory sorry, sorry, markers and cytokines, which have been found in correlation with AFib, were shown after in intense endurance exercise. AFib management generally uh, of an athlete should be similar to that of the general population, although there are some differences. Uh, a reduction of exercise load is recommended to reduce the, f uh, the burden of AFib. Sometimes it may be sufficient, but not always desired by the athlete. Rate control can, uh, may be ideal for competitive, maybe not ideal, sorry, for competitive athlete, as this can impair their performance and because of their baseline sinus bradycardia. Generally, rhythm control strategy is the preferred means of treatment. Class 1C antiarrhythmic drugs, include flecainide and popafenone, may be able to prevent AFib recurrences, but they are not recommended to be used in monotherapy without the appropriate rate control. Pill in the packet approach is also an option, could be a good option for patients with a paroxysmal AFib. All these limitations bring up an early discussion about ablation, and we know from small series that uh, uh, the outcome of uh, catheter ablation is similar to the uh, general population. Other SVTs are not more common in athletes, but it, uh, if present, exercise can trigger them. Finding of pre-excitation, as you can see in this EKG, uh, is, uh, in athlete is often uh, uh, challenging and a, a, bit, a little bit uh, a concern. The generally, you should be concerned uh, for those athletes with accessory pathway travel uh, having short refractory periods that will um, allow very rapid ventricular rates during AFib and may lead to sudden cardiac death. Finding of uh, intermittent pre-excitation, as you can see here on serial EKGs or on extended monitoring, is reassuring. On the other hand, we can see here uh, EKG with AFib and rapid conduction to the ventricle via a bypass tract. Those findings are concerning. Based on the American Heart Association scientific statement from 2015, in athletes with asymptomatic pre-excitation, it is reasonable to attempt risk stratification with stress testing to determine whether the pre-excitation abruptly terminates at lower heart rate, and if it is inconclusive with EP study. Ablation of the bypass tract is recommended if it found to have refractory period of 250 milliseconds or less. The two most common cardiac regions for idiopathic VT are outflow tract VT and left posterior fascicle VT. Both VTs can be triggered by exercise. Most of the outflow, outflow tract VTs originate from the right ventricle outflow tract. On the EKG, uh, we will typically see left bundle branch block pattern and inferior uh, axis. Outflow tract VTs are generated by focal activations arising from the delayed after the polarizations and exacerbated by exercise induced sympathetic stimulation. The age of presentation is usually 30 to 50 years and patients generally have a benign clinical course. Syncope is rare and sudden cardiac death is extremely rare. 
and a strong consideration should be given to ablation as the ablation is curative and generally low risk. Left posterior fascicle VT, also known as uh, verapamil uh, sensitivity, is originating uh, in the LV in an otherwise uh, normal heart. In this case, the reantent mechanism involves the Purkinje network, neighboring the posterior fascicle. The arrhythmia is sensitive to catecholamines and may be precipitated by exercise or emotional stress. The exact mechanism for such sensitivity are unclear. Ablation of fascicular VT has an 80 to 90 percent success rate. I will next, uh, in, in the next section, I will review a few conditions associated with increased risk by exercise. First, ARVC. ARVC characterized by progressive replacement of the right ventricle myocardium with fatty and fibrous tissue. It is an inherited disorder that in, uh, the inheritance is typically autosomal dominant with viable penetrans. Mutation has been mostly observed in genes encoding proteins uh, of the cardiac desmosomes. Mutation can be found in about two-thirds of the patients. The estimate mutation prevalence is up to 1 in 1,000. This is a very arrhythmogenic condition. The disease provides a substrate for reentrant ventricular arrhythmia and is associated with increased risk of sudden cardiac death. As I mentioned before, ARVC was found to be the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in athletes in Italy. Exercise was found to be an important modulator of, uh, of the phenotype expression, progression, and prognosis of ARVC. Exercise may cause higher penetrance of the disease. There are evidence from several retrospective studies suggested that there is a dose-dependent relationship between exercise and the likelihood of developing ARVC. Here is shown data from a cohort of people with known mutation of ARVC. They found that number of hours per year of exercise impact whether they have met the diagnostic criteria. Of carriers who uh, exercise 0 to 134 hours per year, only third had the disease, whereas carriers who exercise more than 510 hours per year had 85% had the disease. When compared endurance athletic, yes or no, 33% of uh, no compared to 82% of yes had the disease. Also, in carriers of mutation who take uh, on endurance exercise, symptoms can occur at a younger age. On the right, you can see data from, uh, of patients with ARBC that were analyzed retrospectively based on their exercise habits. Symptoms developed at an earlier age in patients who participated in competitive sports when compared with patients who participate in recreational sport or uh, in act, uh, active patients. Exercise also increased the arrhythmic risk in patients with ARVC and high, intense, um, high intensity exercise was found to be a strong independent uh, predictor of life-threatening arrhythmias with an eightfold uh, increase in risk. The mechanism explaining the interaction between exercise and ARVC is complex. Generally, ARVC is due to mutations in genes encoding proteins that are involved in cell adhesion as desmosomal protein. As a result of the alteration of those proteins, there is a disruption of normal cell adhesion and mechanical stability, cell-to-cell -cell communication, and electrical coupling. This results in instability in the setting of mechanical stress, such as a cure with exercise. Exercise cause an increase in the wall stress of ventricles um, right ventricle more than the left ventricle. Using a, a simple analogy, we can say that if the desmosomes represent the glue connecting the myocytes, then disease can be caused by weakness of the glue, high mechanical force on the glue, or both. Also, wall stress can stimulate fibroblasts and microphags, and those can cause the position of collagen with patchy area of fibrosis. All that that I mentioned can cause substrate changes that may lead to arrhythmia. There is no single cr criteria for diagnosis of ARVC. The diagnosis requires a combination of a major and minor cr uh, criteria, including structural, histological, electrocardiographic, arrhythmogenic, and genetic factors. TY inversion, uh, T wave inversion sorry, in lead V1 and V4 to V4 in the absence of complete right bundle branch block is a major diagnostic abnormality in ARVC. T-wave inversions are also common EKG finding in healthy athletes and is frequently caused a confusion in the setting of pre-participation uh, screening. For instance, in this slide, you can see in the left EKG from an healthy athlete and in the right from ARVC patient. 
Both EKGs can be interpreted as a pathologic. This study sought to compare EKGs of athletes and ARVC patients matched one, one to one for age, sex, and ethnicity. They have concluded that the presence of T-wave inversion or J-point elevation are relatively poor discriminator, whereas PVCs and low QRS voltage are more prevalent among ARVC patients than athletes. According to the, late H to the latest HRS expert consensus statement, clinicians should counsel individuals with positive genetic test and negative phenotype that intense endurance exercise is not recommended. Individuals with diagnostic ARVC should not participate in intense endurance exercise. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, as I mentioned, is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in U.S. athletes. It has a prevalence of 1 in 500 in the general population. The probable cause of sudden cardiac death in most patients is VT, originating from a myocardial scarring or from distorted electrophysiological propagation due to disorganized arrangement of the cardiac muscle cells. The underlying electrophysiological substrate is unpredictable. It is potentially sub subject to instability by interaction with physiological stress inherent to endurance activity. Participation in, uh, competitive athletic, uh, in comp uh, competitive athletics for asymptomatic genotype positive patient without evidence of LVH is reasonable. Um, athletes with any clinical expression and diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy should not participate in most competitive sports. The next syndrome I will review is Long QT syndrome. It has a prevalence of 1 in 2000. It is caused by 16 genes, of which three are responsible for almost 90% of cases. The conditions associated with the arrhythmias in long QT syndrome are largely gene-specific, as you can see in the figure on the right. Long QT1 is the most common type of long QT syndrome, and typically in this case, the, ar the arrhythmic events are triggered by adrenergic stimuli and exercise, usually torsade de poivity. There is a strong association specifically to swimming. <coughs> in long QT1, there is a loss of function mutation in IKS potassium channel. As I mentioned before, normally sympathetic stimulation will cause phosphorylation of the alpha subunit IKS and enhance the potassium current, leading to shortening of the action potential, uh, potential and shortening of the QTC. The responsible mutation impairs shortening of the action potential duration with adrenergic stimulation and cause paradoxical increase in QTC. In the specific arrhythmogenic mechanism typically involve early after depolarization and torsa de poids. Sympathetic at uh, symptomatic athletes with any suspect channelopathy should be first restricted from all competitive sports until full evaluation has been completed. It is recommended that the genetic cardiologist or electrophysiologist will be consulted for any return to play decision. For an asymptomatic athlete with genotype positive but phenotype negative, it's reasonable to participate in all competitive sport with appropriate precautionary measures. Per the American Heart uh, Association guidelines, competitive sport participation may be considered also for some symptomatic long QT syndrome patient, provided that the treatment, uh, that uh, treatment and appropriate precautionary measures have been taken and that the patient is stable on treatment for at least three months. The last disease I will mention is catecholaminergic polymorphic VT, CPVT. CPVT is a rare inherent disorder this is, uh, uh, that characterized by adrenergically induced syncope and sudden death. The estimate prevalence is uh, 1 to 10,000. CPVT is one of the most malignant disorders. Approximately 80% of untreated CPVT patients develop symptoms by age 40 and overall mortality is 30 to 50%. The hallmark of CPVT is exercise induced by directional VT, which could degenerate to polymorphic VT and VF. Sudden cardiac death can be the first manifestation of the disease in a significant proportion of, the, of cases. CPVT is caused by mutation in genes that encode for key calcium regulatory proteins. Two genetic variants have been described. The most common is an autosomal dominant trait caused by mutation in the uh, RYR2 gene, and the second is recessive from associ uh, form associated with mutation in the uh, calsequestrin gene. Those mutations are found in approximately 60% of patients. 
Both mutations are critically involved uh, in the regulation of cal uh, cardiac excitation contraction coupling. The mutation lead to leaky calcium release channels, which result in excessive release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum in the cell, particularly during sympathetic stimulation that can precipitate calcium overload during electrical diastole, delayed after the polarization, and trigger the arrhythmias. CPVT is likely uh, the channelopathy most vulnerable to exercise as a pro-arrhythmic trigger. Comparative sports beyond uh, 1A sport, which is like golf um, and etc., are, are not recommended for the athlete with symptomatic CPVT or an asymptomatic with the documented exercise induced PVCs or non sustained VT. So, a few take home messages uh, to sum up this review. Several physiological changes in the athlete can increase risk for arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death in some individuals. In the normal heart, with no genetic or structural predisposition, exercise at a, a moderate level is safe and can reduce arrhythmia risk. The most common arrhythmias are AFib and bradycardia. Intense ex uh, exercise significantly increases the risk of AFib for men. Specific diseases are modulated by exercise. Given the limited time, I chose to focus on, the specific di on those specific diseases, as they have well-known arrhythmogenic association with exercise. Other conditions to also keep in mind are premature coronary artery disease in the older athlete, congenital coronary anomalies, and other channelopathies. Detraining should be considered and coordinated with a disease-specific management, and management of some cases may prove challenging, requiring referral to a specialist, such as electrophysiologist or an expert in channelopathies, HOCAM, or CPVT. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ali. That was an excellent review on a very interesting topic that we don't normally get exposed to. Um, a couple of questions. So um, when is exercise too much? We all talk <laughs> about recommending exercise to patients and uh, you know the benefits of exercise are undeniable, but um, when, I, when is someone getting at risk of developing exercise-induced AFib or um, when should we be watching about the amount of exercise? So this is a general question uh, and of course complex uh, answer. I think generally I can summarize everything that we talked uh, uh, today as that the exercise, the relationship with exercise and arrhythmia is, uh, depends on the, on the patient. Uh, if you have any, any problem with your heart or any inherent uh, problem or uh, family history of anything, then you need to be cautious. Um, if the heart is normal and uh, the, you build your exercise uh, gradually, most of the time it will be uh, okay. Um, there are some people that are prone to more uh, arrhythmia and unfortunately you cannot know that. Mm. Um, we do know because of the high, um, because of the prevalence of recently of a lot of people that exercise vigorously, triathletes and uh, marathon runners, that there is a little bit more, um, you can see a little bit more uh, AFib patient uh, younger than usual. And those patients, you just need to tell them that you need to relax and detrain. So I don't think there is a specific formula to say just run X miles per week or less. Mm. I think it's very individual for the patient. A very simple question. Are yeah. marathons healthy? <laughs> um, I guess any, anything in the extreme is not healthy uh, and moderate uh, class uh, physical activity is healthy. I am a marathon uh, runner, I love it. Uh, I'm trying to moderate it and not do it too much, um, but um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned detraining as, as a therapeutic tool, yeah. uh, how do we monitor uh, besides just counting the amount of exercise. Is there any structural changes that you would look into um, that could tell you, well, this patient has already detrained? Do you see regression of LV hypertrophy or, or changes in chamber sizes? Uh, few of the changes are reversible and few are not. Uh, you can know that, I mean, few of the changes of the structural changes, but also few of the electrical changes. You can see that even uh, 
some bradycardia will maintain, mm. but uh, um, I think this is part of the de training uh, that you follow an athlete. You are asking him to reduce less than 50%, to do less than 50% than he did before, and you continue to follow. If there, uh, there is no reversibility, uh, then sometimes you need to do more, um, more tests like MRI to see if mm. there is scarring, and then you need to think maybe hypertrophy uh, is not reversible, well, maybe we need to think about something else. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was an excellent review. Thank you. All right.